John chapter 4, at verse 13 and 14. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Jesus understands our need for water very well. And we understand our need for water very well. They say a human being can go no longer than three days. And by day two, you're not doing very well at all. So three would be the, the farthest that, uh, that we as humans can go without water. And that's why all of civilization is built near water. We all have to have water around us. Of course, we need it. We need a lot of it. Jesus understood that. Uh, we also need food. <laughs> food is very important. Uh, the Lord has blessed me with lots of food. And um, I don't know that I needed that much blessing, but here it is. And, uh, but, you know, um, I came across the, a really funny story. I don't know. The guy doesn't, I, 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 I shouldn't say it's funny because there are people who follow along and, and suffer as a result of it. But they're called breatharians. And if you're a breatharian, uh, you know, I'm very, I hope you don't be offended. And, um, but a breatharian is somebody who believes that the need for food is a myth. And it's been propagated, you know, by capitalist pigs. And uh, you really don't need food. And it's been that way. So what they have done, they have realized that uh, the need for food is a joke. Uh, what we have is a blessing from God in the moon rays and the sun. And so if you were to enjoy the moon rays and the sun, you would not need uh, food. And uh, these people are real. And um, there they are. I, you know, every once in a while, people, and, and uh, uh, of course, Hollywood celebrities, they jump on these things and they pay a lot of money for counseling. How can I um, receive my nutrition like, um, like a weed? you know, or any other plant, tomato plant, or whatever it is out there. I'm sure I'm able to do photosynthesis like the blessed of any plant. And uh, what happens, it doesn't work all that well. And so, um, have you ever noticed that when they talk about weird people in the United States, many, many times those weird people live in the Bay Area? Have you ever noticed that? <laughs> I've lived in a lot of places. Every place has weird people. But boy, the Bay Area really stands out when it comes to quantity and quality of weirdness. And there's one guy in Santa Cruz, and, and he charges a lot of money to come and learn this until somebody, he said he hadn't eaten in, in decades, until somebody took a picture of him coming out of a 7-Eleven with a big Slurpee, a hot dog, and Twinkies. And so <laughs> evidently it was a cloudy day or I don't know. It was indoors all day. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, it's well established that you, you can't think you don't need food. You, you need food. That, that's beyond that. Jesus comes up to a moment in this woman's life, this lady at the well. And uh, go, with you, me, go with me, if you will, to all the way down Aborn and stop right there on White and then make a right and then we'll have Lucky Supermarket. And let's say it was Jesus coming all the way from Santa Cruz. There'd be a lot of ministry to do in Santa Cruz. And by the time he got almost to our church, he would be exhausted, be very, very hungry. He'd be very, very tired and he'd be extremely thirsty. Jesus' friends go off to buy lunch. Evidently, nobody left him any money for water. And he's standing there, and he sees a lady come in with a grocery cart. And so she's trying to ignore him, but he gets in her way, and he says, Hey, when you go in there, can you please buy me a bottle of water? And the lady would look at him, and she would say, Wow. Oh. I thought they had rules against beggars at Lucky's. <laughs> if you, been, you have permission to be here, I could call the manager and have you removed. And Jesus' response to her would simply be, well, <laughs> you could do that. But if you knew who was asking you for this water, you would ask them for water instead. And then she would look at him and she would go, I don't think so. <laughs> because you asked me for water. Obviously, you don't have enough money to buy yourself water. You're not going to be buying me any water anytime soon. And Jesus' response to that is a beautiful and important response to it. He says, look it. The water I have that I'm offering you is exactly what we've read in this verse. 
I am offering you water that you will never be thirsty again if you drink this. It will meet your need not only for your lifetime, but it will also meet your need for all of eternity. And the lady's thinking, well, this is a nut. Let's play along. <laughs> okay, then give me some of this water. And Jesus says, you go get your husband, come back, and I'll give you this water. To which she turns around and says, <laughs> you don't know anything. I don't have a husband. So why don't you just go ahead and give me this water and let's get this over with, if you really have water. At which point, all of a sudden, we're not talking about water anymore. Jesus changes the subject. And he talks about what this woman really needs and what really hurts this woman. She might have been thirsty. I don't know. But one thing I do know is that she had a terrible need in her heart for somebody to love her, just like all of us do. And she was very frustrated and disappointed in her attempts to find that love. And Jesus says, no, you don't have a husband. You've had five husbands, and now you're looking for number six. And she looks at him, and she just has a moment of clarity. Maybe I'm not talking to a beggar. Maybe I'm not talking to somebody who's desperate. Maybe I'm not talking to somebody who shouldn't be here. Maybe I'm talking to somebody who really knows something about me. And she takes a step forward. She leans into just a little bit more and, and kind of tests this thing out. She says, you know, I see you're a, a very spiritual person. She goes, you know, I'm a spiritual person. I have lots of spiritual beliefs. And, you know, I too, I'm able to see things, but you, you're amazing. How did you ever know that about me? And uh, Jesus says, you know, lots of people have spiritual beliefs, and we're all kinds. Some spiritual beliefs are right. Some spiritual beliefs are wrong. The ones that come from God, those spiritual beliefs are right. And her response to that is, you know what? I have spiritual beliefs that don't come from your God. That doesn't mean they're wrong. That just means they're my spiritual beliefs. So I'll tell you what, when we all die, we're going to figure out whose spiritual beliefs were right. Then we'll all know that will settle it. So there's no reason for you and my, me to be arguing about this. And what Jesus' response was, very interesting, came back and he basically said, that's kind of why I'm here. <laughs> I've come to abolish death. I've come that if you might believe in me, you will never die. And that really got to that woman's heart. She turns around and says, what is going on? She realized that the subject had changed very early. That we're not talking about our physical need for water. We're talking about a deep spiritual need that we have. And reality is, our need for God, our need for love, our need for relationships, our need for other people is far, far greater than our physical needs. Far greater than our physical needs. But we deceive ourselves many times. We get into situations where we say, hey, if I can have this and I can have this and there's always physical things, I'm going to be okay. You know, people say, well, how much do you need for retirement? Well, this is what I need. Completely ignoring the emotional and the spiritual needs that we inevitably have. And we all know that unless those are met, we don't want to drink water. We don't want to survive another day. It's not worth living. It's a whole other type of struggle. You have to have that motivation. And God has wired this world in such a wonderful way that we don't plug in automatically with because of sin. When God created the world, his intention was that we would live in his presence continually. And nature and all the world would, would uh, support that and affirm that and help out with that. But sin came and separated everybody. So now we are left with a desire for the things that only God can meet and what God has designed. We are wired for that, but there's nowhere to plug into. And so what we end up doing is plugging into stuff that we hope will work. You ever had uh, tried to charge your phone with somebody else's charger and it just wasn't the right brand and what didn't fit in right or anything like that? We all do that and it just doesn't work unless it's plugged into the right thing. Now we're talking. Now progress is being made. And that's what the situation of humanity is. When we find out about this, the, the Las Vegas killer, and we find out how empty he was on the inside. Boy, he seemed to have a whole, all the needs he would ever need met, and a whole lot more if he'd been a little bit more generous in the right ways. You know, but that's not what the problem was, though, was it? That's not the problem at all. You know, inundated, you know, with a Harvey Weinstein conversations and, and news, and I'm thinking, geez, what's up with that? Could you be on? Well, I think what scares me the most is if there's somebody like that so distant that is ravaging so many people's lives because of their own emptiness and their, their own desperation and their own sickness, 
How many are there that are closer to my level that nobody pays attention to because they don't have the world's limelight on them? And, and you know, it just makes me so nervous and it just reminds me how important it is for us to have that need for love met in our lives, that need for love. You know, let me tell you something kind of scary about love. We always think we don't deserve it. And we always think we got to work for it. In fact, a very good question that this woman could have had of Jesus was simply this. Why are you helping me? Why do you care about me? They were as far apart culturally as, as a situation could be in Jesus' day. There is a billion reasons why she should never have been near Jesus and a billion reasons why Jesus should never have been them, much less ever talk to each other. Yet Jesus crosses all those barriers, crashes through all those, those obstacles and all the divides that existed to meet her need and to help her, to help her, to help her, to bring God's presence into her life. Why? Why? Isn't there other people that need that? But Jesus broke all those barriers and met her need. And the reason is very simple. It's the same reason that Jesus breaks all the cultural barriers, why he breaks all the obstacles, he goes through all the baggage that we might put up in front. He breaks through all of that. Why? Because he loves you. Because he loves you. He loves you with, an unfa with, with, with a faithfulness. He loves you with, with, with a perseverance. He loves you with, with an absolute adoring, absolute desire to reach you and to hold you and for you to be close to him. That's what he desires. And the reason it all fits into our world is because God also has a future plan for this world where sin will be obliterated and we will not be cursed by sin anymore, but we will now live in a world that was more intended as God created it to be. And we're looking forward to that day and each of us play a part in bringing that about. And the measure that we are close to God, God is able to reach us and to touch us and to help us be a part of his plan for the future of the world, for the salvation of the world. And as God does that, it all works into, I love you. I love you. I love you. And I am mad about you. I desire you, like you can't believe, to be close to you and be with you. That's Jesus' thing. And when he does that, he says, and you play a very important part in my plan for the salvation of the world. I have things for you to do. I have people for you to love. I have people for you to help. It's all part of that. And that's why God reaches you. And that's why God reaches me because he loves us and he has work for us to do for him. He has things for us to do. That's how God brings this whole thing about. But what happens is in our sinful nature, this is very serious. This is a big problem. In our sinful nature, what we soon discover is, is that our need for love is far greater than our ability to love. That our need for love is far greater than our ability to love. And so how does that get complicated? It gets complicated like this. Because we give love to people in our relationships, whether it be co-workers or friends or spouses or families, whatever it might be. We give love with a desire, with a hope, an expectation that they're going to give love back. I need love, so I need you to love me in return. That there is a recipe for disaster. Because they can love you for a period of time, but at some point the tables are going to turn. And all of a sudden, somebody's going to say, I love you more than you're loving me. And when, as soon as that happens, something happens in our brains and we stop. And we say, I am going to be pulling back on my love for you until your love for me gets a little bit higher and we get that back to where it needs to be. <laughs> and does this sound familiar to anybody? <laughs> we get in a situation... I read about two attorneys, and they had gone to school together, and they helped each other, and they were great friends, and as, as true as the word friendship can be, and they went through school, they went through the job search, they ended up at the same law firm, at the same place, and they went in, and it was really hard, and they were treated very poorly, and they just kept fighting and helping each other out, and they just kept going up, until one day, one of them said, you know, you should have given me more credit for what I did. And his friend disagreed. No, I gave you all the credit you needed. I was good. I was fair about that. And then that little disagreement happened. And you know what the other friend did? He turned around and found a, a good moment, which is very soon, doesn't take long, these moments to emerge, 
to tear down his friend, to say something that, was, that would hurt his feelings or make him look like an idiot in front of other people. And as soon as he did that, what do you think the other friend did? Oh, yeah? <laughs> Let me tell you, I know you really well. You don't even messing with me. I know stuff about you. And now our, the, the, the secretary pool is going to know stuff about you. And so it starts. And so instead of building each other up, they now become t attacking each other, and it begins the spiral straight down right into hell itself. It just goes straight down. And Jesus, when he was speaking to this woman, he knew he was speaking to somebody who had spiraled down and hit rock bottom five times, and she was about to hit it number six. He understood that about her. And what he said to her was so beautiful and so powerful. He gave her the secret of life. He gave her the secret of love. He, he told her, this is what it is. It says, you know the way you desperately need water? Okay, just in the way that you need water. You need somebody to love you just like that. That's what you need. Don't underestimate it. Don't think you do. You really do. You need somebody to love you like that. But there is no person in the world that can love you the way you need to be loved. There is no person. You will never be able to love somebody enough for them to love you like you need to be loved. There is no place of work that is going to treat you so well and bring so much meaning to your life that is going to meet that huge demand of, I just need to know that I'm loved. I just need to know that I'm important. I just need to know that I have value. There is no drug. There is nothing out there in the world, nothing that's going to meet the need that you have that's sizing. And that's why we see people get into trouble time and time and time again because of their desperate need to fill that desire. Sometimes it's just pretending that the world doesn't exist anymore and they'll go off into that world. But it's all to mask their need and their desire and their hope that somebody would value them, somebody would love them. And that's where we find ourselves. And a lot of times in these relationships, what happens is we transfer that as we learned to deal with people in that way about getting from people. And so all of a sudden it becomes, I know you're not going to love me back. I understand that. Or I know it's limited. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to redefine our relationship. And it's not anymore about what you can give me. It's about what I can get out of you. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to learn to be happy with the best and the most that I can get out of you. And so now the conversation shifts and changes. It now becomes a relationship of where somebody's coming and saying, you know what? I don't care how you do it. I don't care about this. I just need this. I just need that. And you know what it always is? Material needs. It's all, it goes back to material. They have no hope of receiving that love. It's the material needs. And they go after it and they, and they get. Or maybe they just need something to help their esteem or their pride or whatever. I just need to look good in front of these people. You, you can be good for that. Can't you dress up every once in a while for this short amount of time for me as I go out? Can you do that? And I'll pay what I got to pay to make that happen like that. And it's all about what I can get out of you. And that becomes the definition of all of our relationships. Subtly and inevitably, our relationship with God. And we come to God with that same desire to get. And we come to God and say, okay, God, I see your word. I see your promises. What do I got to do to get that? I'm in a situation where I need a miracle. I'm in a situation where things are completely out of my control. What do I got to do for you to meet my need? And we keep doing that. We go right to God and say, what can I get out of God? What can I get out of God? Let me tell you what you can get out of God. You can get nothing out of God. God is not your spouse. God is not your coworker. God is not your child. God is not your parent. God is not any of those things. God is God. God is God. And he cannot... It is impossible to get anything out of Getting implies that you went, you negotiated something, and you got it. That's what it implies. You can't do that to God. That, that's just completely crazy. It's insane to think you can get something out of God. Well, what can you do? You can do exactly what Jesus explained to this woman. You can receive from God. You can receive from God. You can go into the presence of God, and you can say, I got nothing. I've got nothing. I've got a long list of regrets. I've got failures. I've got demands on my life. I've got problems, and I've got nothing. When you come to God like that, when you come into a relationship with him where you're not there to get anything, you're there to receive. 
And you will be amazed how just that mindset begins to change everything from the inside out of your life. When you come, and that's what our worship is when we come on Sunday mornings. It's about standing here in the presence of Jesus and receiving his presence, receiving his glory, receiving his touch, receiving his word. I'm receiving from God. I'm receiving from God. That's water to my parched, dying soul. It's water that I've been dying and needing to have so bad. I'm standing here in the presence, and I am receiving, and I am receiving of this water of life. I'm receiving. That's what that is. That's just coming in. And that's what each of us need to do is we need to look at our relationships and say, oh, no, (laughs) that's not what you're here for. You are not here to give me the love that I need because you don't have it. (laughs) You don't have it. I need to go to God who has more, more, more than all the love in the world that I would ever, ever need. I need to go to him and receive that love. And every day, open up God's word, not to become a theologian per se, not to become a, a, you know, literally, uh, uh, you know, amazing about God's word. No, no, no. I come to receive of God. That's why I go to the Lord in prayer. I don't go to demand, I got to do this and you got to do that. And here's your to-do list. And here's my, no, no, no. We go to the Lord in prayer to receive, to simply receive. And we receive. And don't we receive? You know, so many people throughout history, they have gone to that verse where where Jesus said, I will give you life. I will give you water and you will never thirst again. And it's going to well up to springs of eternal life in you. And nobody, or very, very few people, very few people who have seen that and experienced that would ever say, oh, I, I can't relate to that. Well, what he did for her, he didn't do for me. Nobody ever says that. You know what they say? This is what we all say. I know exactly what that woman is about to get. (laughs) Because one day I was the one who was parched. I was the one who was in the desert. I was the one who was thirsty. And nobody was giving me water. And Jesus came by and I found Jesus. And when I found Jesus, I found everything I ever needed. I thought I needed this. I thought I, I did it. All I needed was Jesus. That's an experience that Christians have had for millenniums now. When they come to Jesus, they find all the love they need. Need. You don't need it in anything. You don't need it in anybody. You need it in Jesus. But that's water. That's what water's good. Water's good. We all have to have water. We need a lot of water, a lot of water. But we also need food. We also need food. There's a part here in the story of Jesus where the, his, his disciples came. And what did they say? We brought lunch back, Jesus. And Jesus' response is what? Hey, I've already, I've already eaten. I've got food that you guys don't know anything about. And they're like, well, what are you talking about? I don't see any food. They weren't where the woman was. They're still back to thinking about physical things. And this is what he tells them. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. That's my food. That's my bread. That, that's the meat. That's the vegetables. That's what I do. And all of a sudden, it begins to get clear in our minds what a relationship with God really looks like. It means coming to Jesus and receiving from him the love that we so desperately crave that we should never underestimate. And it also means going and loving other people with what we have received from Jesus. And we're just turning around and we're giving it. It's the Father's work. We're doing it. We're loving other people. We're giving to other people. And that is our food. That is our food. You got to have both uh, at a meal, right? How many of you had a meal and there was nothing to drink? Drove me crazy. I keep looking, where can I get something to drink? Where's that crazy waiter? I'm about here to die of thirst, right? Where are they coming? You know, you do that. I got to have something to drink. But how many people are out there loving people out of their own hearts and out of their own selves? And they're just giving and they're doing this and they're caring for that and they're doing, doing, giving, giving, giving. And they're inside saying, I'm just dying here. I I got nothing. I'm just dying. I'll tell you what, they're dying because they don't have any water. It's because they haven't gone back to Jesus and say, Jesus, here I am. Jesus, I got nothing. Can I receive from you? Can I be here in your presence? I tell you what, when you come back to Jesus for that water, you receive the water. You receive the water. Now you're in good shape to go to those with great need and to reach out and to do things in love for them, to care about them. And that's your food. You know, 
how's that food? How's being caring and loving other people food? I don't know, but that's how it was that God designed and wired us. That's why when you talk to people who have a mentally uh, uh, disabled child, someone who suffers from ter some terrible disease, and you're thinking, oh, if I had that child living with me, I don't know how I would ever survive. Well, that's exactly how those parents felt before that child came into their lives. I don't know how I ever do it. But what happens? What happens over a short period of time? It's something very strange. They begin to say, this child has brought more love into our house than we ever knew was possible. Somehow or another, this child has become our world. And let me tell you what, this child has done more to love us than we have ever done to love this child. I don't understand that. But that's what God does. When you move out there and you love people and you reach out for people and you give people out of what you have received, the water you have been quenched with, when you do that, then that becomes a benefit to you. It becomes glory to you. How many times have we seen people go out and, and help somebody poor? And then you come back and you say, wow, I bet those people really appreciated it. And somebody who does that, they always say the same thing. It's all the common experience all over the world, no matter who you are. No, no. I was happy to give that. But let me tell you what, I got a whole lot more out of it than I ever gave. Where does that, how does that happen? It's because you're eating of the bread. You're eating God's food for you. That's what sustains us is giving to other people, giving to other people, giving to other people. That's what it does, that generosity of spirit and having that love for others. Oh, pastor, I don't have that. I know exactly why you don't because you're not over here with Jesus. You're not over here receiving what he has for you, receiving that love. I wouldn't be able to either. Many times I have it and that's my issue. I got to get back to Jesus. I got to get back to, I got to get receiving again. Let me tell you what, how much you eat as opposed to how much you drink? There's quite a difference, isn't there? There's quite a difference. I drink a whole lot more water than I eat. <laughs> you know, I can eat a few meals a day, but man, I'm, I'm looking for something to drink all along. Give me something to drink. Give me something to drink. Is it any different in our spiritual life? I can love, I can love here and there. I can do my very best in these situations. But man, all the time, I got to get myself back to Jesus. I got to get back to Jesus. I got to receive from him. I've got to be filled with him again. And that's how it is. You know, I've seen relationships, this is so strange. I've seen relationships where they become so polarized and so controversial against each other. What people will say, and this isn't a place of work. This can be in a family. This can be in a marriage. This can be in many places. This is what people, and you guys will relate to this. What they'll say is, I don't need you to love me. I'm fine. I don't need that at all. I'm fine. All I need is a, is a, a four walls and I need some food and I need, a, so, you know, the, the electricity to power up and I need the water faucet to give me water and I'm fine. I don't need you. Yeah, that's what they say. And what's that? It's called a lie. <laughs> it's called a lie. That is underestimating our need for love. It's called a lie. Well, if anybody ever says that to you, don't believe them. They're just saying that out of hurt, out of frustration, out of anger. But it's not true. It's not true at all. God has given you to people in your world, in your life, and in your family, in your place of work for you to love. Because they need that love. They need that love. I know you don't have it, but God does. And if you receive from him, you can share it out to them. But you better keep coming back for more water, <laughs> more water. Because you know what? That makes a good meal. When you have plenty to drink and plenty to eat, that's a happy life. That's a very happy life. It's a very happy life physically. And it's a very happy life emotionally and spiritually when you have enough to drink and you have enough to eat. And that's what God wants us to do. That's where God wants us to be. Man, I've seen, I've seen those couples and they come together and they'll, they'll say, you know what? You just mind your own business and I'll mind my own business and we're going to be fine here and, and nothing's going to be any different. You know, I got a vacuum cleaner. Yeah. What else do I need? You know, oh, that's all I need. Meanwhile, their heart is broken. But remember, it doesn't mean they don't need love. What they're saying is I'm not getting it out of you, but I'll go get it because I need it. <laughs> as thirsty as I might be, I need water and I need love. And they reach out and they begin looking for that love to be filled in their hearts. Or they look for somebody else like the woman did. Or maybe they look for alcohol or maybe they look for drugs or maybe they look for a promotion at work or better work or higher pay or, or maybe they look for all these other things that might meet my need for love. And it's all lies. None of that's going to meet their need for love. Jesus meets their need for love and Jesus has given you to them. And that's what God's given us. God wants us to be the ones to love them. You know what? 
People need your love. People need your love. It's not enough just to work together. It's not enough just to live together. They need your love. There's no way of getting around about it. And let me ask you for you. Instead of going to Jesus to receive, the only source of continual life, where are you going? Where are you going for your water? Where are you going for your life? I tell you what, it scares me to death. Think of the places people go, the putrid puddles, polluted you know, name it, name it. Where do you go? And then just think about it. I'm expecting this place to meet my need for love. Really? That's what I'm doing. I'm expecting this place to meet my need for love. Think about it. How's that going to work out? Just take it to its logical conclusion. Is this really going to work? Am I really going to receive love? But I don't really hate to think about it because the answer is no. It's going to end really badly. It's going to end in destruction. I'm going to have to go out and find something else or someone else. If you come back to Jesus, you're done. You're done. You found everything you need. Every time I come to Jesus, I receive from him. And I'm grateful for that. And then a disruption comes and I've got to get back, you know, to whatever's on the to-do list. And I always feel that I leave something on the table. I always feel there was more. There was more. And you know, I've had that my entire life. There's always more in Jesus for you. There's always more love for you. And you can never get enough. You can never get enough. And I invite you in your own life to, to just ask yourself, do I need to be going to Jesus for water or am I going to other places? What have I done? Where, where, where am I going to meet? Have my demand for love met? I need to go to Jesus. Let me ask you, how much, how much water do you need? How often do you need water? Let me tell you what, because that's somewhat of a guide to how much you need Jesus, the water of life. You need him all the time. You need him all through the day. You know, people, civilizations build themselves around sources of water. We need to build our lives around the source of living water. We need to make that a part of our daily lives, have access, access, access. Because in this world, you got to drink and you got to eat to be happy. And that's what we do. We receive and we love. And that's what God designed us to be. There we find a healthy, we find a very emotionally stable, we find a very spiritually fulfilling life when we receive and we love others and let God take care of the rest. Watch him do that in your life. I challenge you, step up to it. Love the people God's given you. Love them. You don't have, they don't have to love you back. That, that's not a part of requirement. You just need to go back to Jesus. That's what you need. And then love the people God's given you. Let that happen. Let, let the rest be in God's hands. You just eat and drink. That's what you got to do. That's good news, isn't it? All you got to do is eat and drink? Yes, that's all you got to do. You just got to eat and drink. Eat and drink. And let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, I just lift up this congregation. Lord, we represent really hundreds of families and situations and, and relationships around. And Lord, I ask that you would anoint them for your work and for your service. But Lord, I pray that not only would you anoint them for the work that they have to do and that that would be immensely satisfying to them, but Lord, I also pray that these would be people who come to Jesus every day, many times a day, and they find themselves receiving, receiving from the one who loves them the most, the one who has all the loves, the only one that can meet all their desires, all their love demands in their own heart. Heavenly Father, may we be a church of people who receive from Jesus and we give Jesus' love to others. Let us be a church, Lord, that eats and drinks very well from your well and for your wellspring in our lives. For this lifespan and into eternity, let it never change. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen.